you know, I, I feel almost embarrassed saying this, but if, if we think that the climate crisis is the biggest challenge facing the human race for the next century, then what is higher education's responsibility to the world? Welcome back to part two with Brian Alexander. I, I talked to a couple of presidents from uh, colleges and universities that told me they weren't interested in doing much on climate. And, and one of them told me, there's an interesting story that uh, he was in a very rural location and they sourced their electrical power from a local company uh, that burned coal or, or uh, natural gas, I forget which. Um, and that was a long-standing community partnership. I mean, it wasn't a giant, yeah. company, it wasn't mobile. It was like, you know, Fred's coal company or something. Um, and and they weren't going to change. Uh, they were locked yeah. in firmness. So the president told me, look, if, if I try to source away from them, I'm going to be burning some bridges in the community. Mm, uh, right. So that's interesting. Uh, another president <laughs> told me that uh, she thought that her students just didn't care that their main goal in life was to get bigger trucks. Um, and, and so I told her, look, that's interesting. Maybe you're going to become part of your brand will be anti-climate. Um, that, mm -hmm. you know, if, if students don't want to do anything about climate change, then they go to you. And she was initially pretty appalled by this. But then I wonder, you know, maybe that's a selling point for you. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. When you see the little microphone in the lower right, click on that to learn more. We're so glad you're here. The ASHI STARS system is something that a lot of campuses use. I know it's very popular in New York State. So ASHI, um, what is it? The Association of Sustainability in Higher Education, the American Association of Sustainability in Higher Education, and they have a STARS program. And, and when you're talking about the campus within the community, one of their pillars, they have four, I think, one of their pillars is that community relationship piece. So in that system, uh, in that lens of understanding sustainability for a higher education, they have always understood that community is is and relationships is a part of the sustainability metrics, which I think is wonderful, quite wonderful. Mm. Um, I don't know. I know there are six or seven hundred institutions that engage with with ashy stars, but I don't know if it's if it's on political lines or if it's in only yeah. certain states. I'd have to look. I haven't looked at it in that way. Well, there's a whole politics to this, and it's it's usually not very huge. Open. Um, and no. uh, in a state like like New York, where you've got incredibly fraught state politics, um, to put it mildly, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I I dread the thought of having to go to Albany and, and work with the legislature. You know, that's just just a, a, a nightmare. But um, but <laughs> you have you have yes, to think. You're right. And, and and this can this can go in in all kinds of ways. What if you're you know in a uh, in a very red state and the governor. Or the state government passes a law that says, you know, something like, you, know you 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 cannot ban fossil fuel cars from campus, um, and then the students and faculty say, well, we want to do that. We think these vehicles are dangerous, and you know, uh, I mean, all kinds of, of, of friction opens up. Plus, plus research. Uh, Dickinson College had its students in their sustainability program do a, a, a carbon footprint map of the town. They presented it to the uh, town leadership, and the town leadership loved it. They hadn't had one, and this was very useful to them. Um, so, do you, you know, do you get you know, some kind of synergies and syntheses like this? We need to redefine the relationships. I went to RPI, and a couple uh -oh. of years before I got there, there was this real disparity between the town of Troy and RPI, where there, there, like the friction was horrible, and the students did this thing where they started putting stickers on, this is when people use paper money, right? They started putting little stickers on every dollar that they spent in the city of Troy to remind the city of Troy that students moved a lot of money through that community. Mm. And, and it was mm. like after five or six months of that, they actually started to open conversations between the campus and the city in a, in a different way. Um, and so when I got there, uh, the the relationship was better at that point. It still wasn't healthy, <laughs> but it was better. Um, and I think that that what you're talking about could, yeah, there's a lot of uh, line drawing between colleges and the communities that they're in. And, and climate action is an obligation. 
you know, I, I feel almost embarrassed saying this, but if, if we think that the climate crisis is the biggest challenge facing the human race for the next century, uh, if it's you know, an existential threat of unparalleled uh, depth and complexity, uh, then what is higher education's responsibility to the world? I mean, right. This is this is a hard question, and it goes beyond should we have recycling in the dorms. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, think should we, for example, you know, make an ethical commitment to do more research on this? Um, should we really have more public intellectuals, you know, for faculty out in the community, wherever the community is? Um, trying to advise and share their research with us. Um, should we, for example, what's our intellectual responsibility? Should, are we, if we're experiencing a civilizational transformation akin in depth to the Industrial Revolution, mm -hmm. is it our job to bring our intellectual firepower to bear and help people think through degrowth economics, um, yeah. you know, new religious formations, uh, the, the, the incredibly challenging ethics and geoengineering? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, if we don't do this, other people are going to do it. And so you're going to have people in the public sphere from, you know, Hollywood is making movies about this. There are computer games. There are novels. Uh, mm -hmm. Religious bodies are issuing rulings. Congress is, you know, shambling in this direction slowly and badly. Um, you know, I mean, should it's we? It's huge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what's, what, you know, how much of a role should we play? If you're not excited, step aside. Yeah. yeah, I have like two things and I was so yeah. mad at my dog right there. Um, <laughs> I ch I will outright, I, I guess I'm embarrassed to use this word, but I chastise people between groups that I'm in, students that I teach. I am now to the point where when I hear pessimistic approaches about everything and this reductionist kind of idea, I now chastise and say, you don't understand. This is the biggest opportunity you have of a lifetime. I go, this is, this yeah. is the time to get creative. This is exciting. And if you're not excited, like get out of the way because yeah. there are those of us that are. Um, so I think to your point, having more people out in the community, being vocal and inspiring mm -hmm. is great. My secondary point to all of this and that I'm worried about is as being a part of a university where we are seeing decreased enrollment, much like many of the other colleges and universities nationwide, I'm sitting here saying, okay, now we've got even less people that are going to be out there able to do this. Yeah. Or will we, you know, so what do some of these other platforms start to look like? We always go back to Jody's son in the situation where he does a lot of, you know, self, self teaching almost um, in areas of interest on his end. So does the entire idea of higher education start to look entirely different? Right. We had a conversation about how education, um, higher education in specific, yeah. uh, can yeah. build on uh, the, the fact that almost everything that's technical or procedural can be learned online. Um, and maybe higher education is the place that has to be about ethics and has to be about emotional intelligence and has to be about cultivation of community. Um, so let's let's talk about that. But I also wanted to throw this in uh, you were talking about, you know, uh, having campuses focus on on on. Did, is there an ethical need there? It takes time for this change. The thing is, our uh, AIA. I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects. Um, mm -hmm. Has had uh, their code of ethics forever, and it's it was more than 10 years ago, they changed their code of ethics to require that every single architect has to talk about sustainability with clients. And recently they changed the code of ethics to be very specific that buildings have to be designed with a responsibility to the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's very, very clear. And there are still people within that voluntary, like I, I join as a member, it's my choice. There are still people who join that organization who are fighting against anyone in AIA talking about climate change. So, so change does not happen easily. And then the other piece, Architecture 2030. Architecture 2030 is an organization, a big think tank organization, and it has to be close to 20 years ago now. They said all we want for higher education for architecture programs is every architecture program needs to put one sentence into every assignment for every student. And that sentence 
should say, this project will also strive to reduce fossil fuel, fuel use. And they said, we just want you to sign on to Architecture 2030, and we want you to put that sentence in every single project that you assign the students, because if they know that's important, they're going to figure out how to solve it. And it's mm. going to change their neural pathways in the process. And God damn it, RPI never put that in, never signed on to 2030. There are a ton of colleges who never signed on. It never became a thing, but I'm thinking there's a whole generation. There's 20 years wasted because we didn't put that sentence into architectural design program project assignments. What happens when we look back from 2050? It's, it's not going to look good in, in the future, you know, looking back at us. Yeah. This is the perspective I keep trying to give people with say, all right, how do we look from the year 2050? Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I talk to uh, a lot of my progressive friends and, and who are, you know, who are interested in what they see as the rise of fascism now. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, what would you do if it was 1930? You know, if you were time traveled to Germany in 1930, what would you do? They're, oh, I'd be in the streets, right? I'd be trying to shoot Hitler. <laughs> Okay, okay. So we're we're looking at a similar level of threat to civilization. What do yeah. you do now? And they say, well, I'm shopping with cloth bags. I'm like, that's that's not enough, you know. You know? <laughs> right. But uh, but I'm curious, Jody. What a, in in the uh, in the previous group, the um, not the architecture 2030s, <laughs> but uh, but the other one, which was looking at um, uh, trying uh, and, and getting resistance. What were what were the resistance arguments? I mean, why? The resistance arguments across the board, and I've been in a couple of these discussions on the forum for the AIA, is that it's a political issue and therefore we can't, it has no relation to our profession. And I think that that comes up in education as well. Um, it came up in, and I'm not going to get into detail because it's a work thing. There was an issue that was posted that was made political by one of the commentators. It didn't have to be a political issue, but so many things that are difficult are turned into political us them issues when they just are design problems that we all have a voice in. And I think that that's what, um, I, I suspect that that weighs in a lot at the higher education level, especially the structures of institutions that need to rely on donations and political support. Um, and I think that that's one of the biggest problems is when we politicize things, it, it it's, it means there's a winner and a loser, and we're not looking at it as a design problem that impacts everyone in vastly different ways. Yeah, yeah. And just, just saying politics is enough to scare people. Are there utopian glimpses? There, there are other reasons for, for academics to not be involved in this. And, and by academics, I mean everybody. I mean faculty, yeah. staff, I mean students. And, uh, and one of the big ones is... Uh, is just the past, depending on who you are and where you are, the past four or six years, um, you know, just dealing with COVID, just dealing with the economic chaos. Um, de again, it depends on your institution um, and it depends on your position in life, but it may be that the Trump years, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, injured you. It may be uh, other issues as well, but, you know, just a lot of, we're hearing lots of faculty and staff burnout and exhaustion. And, and here we come saying, oh, look, here is the world's biggest crisis. <laughs> Add this to your plate. And I said, no, no. Um, I, I think well, another reason is that it's, it's so complex that it's hard to get traction. Um, well, and people, yeah, and people want like an answer so that they can do the thing and fix everything. But it's it's not it's not only complex, but it's it's iterative and developing. So it, it's the messiness is so hugely impactful right now. And it will always be because we're talking about living systems that are always going to be messy. And we, the last, I would say 50, 60, 70 years, we have focused on let's create the engineered solution for that problem. Let's mm -hmm. pick mm -hmm. the marketing uh Thing that's going to win everyone's attention. We have never, we've celebrated everyone who's had success at the optimal level, and we've never celebrated all of the people who are doing all of the other, you know, vital and different and yeah. incremental work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That weird moment in the pandemic when uh, people suddenly celebrated frontline medical workers. Uh, yeah. Huge. One moment. Yeah. And it was, uh, I mean, there were all these 
I mean, to me, almost utopian glimpses in, in the pandemic. Mm. It was the, we shut down you know, industry for a few days and suddenly saw skies again. Uh, <laughs> I know. But, but I, I agree, Jenny. We're, we're, we're hip deep in deep neoliberalism. Uh, mm. Everything about quarterly uh, results for shareholders, uh, higher education in the U.S. is effectively privatized. Uh, everything is That's about right. the market return. Um, you know, the uh, uh, people love to be the CEO of themselves. Um, and I, I think a lot of the world is trembling on the edge of this, feeling that this isn't working. Um, but it's a hard press to figure out where to go next. I mean, except, you know, China has its complete system. You know, Xi Jinping thought that's that's their answer. Um, plus, you're hearing uh, all kinds of alternatives, degrowth, donut economics. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, people under 30 who didn't grow up in the Cold War uh, didn't get all that programming. They're much more open to this. Um, but people over 30, you know, this is existential yeah, dread yeah. stuff. Uh, what do you mean not do capitalism anymore? Um, I want uh, my car. I want my house. I want my thing that's over well, there. I want to fly. The current third rail, it's not food. I thought food would be the killer. I mean, so mm -hmm. because food is so primal for people. If they say, hey, why don't you think about less meat? And I want you to think about fewer animal products. Just, just think about this. And I thought I'd be, I'd be torn from limb to limb, right? But then people are actually ready to think about it. But I said, I want you to fly less. And and I was yeah. accused of a Trump supporter. I was accused of being anti-intellectual. Um, you know, I was accused of not being an academic. Uh, oh. it's, it's, that's the big third rail I found. We're talking about universities on fire. It's universities on fire. Universities and on we fire. definitely want to make sure that we're talking about that book. And I'm going to go, now, is there a, private distributor that I should be buying from or you could just... order directly from Johns Hopkins you okay. could or you could order from uh Amazon Barnes and Noble bookshop.org you know which whichever you like um, I probably will go to my local bookstore and ask them to order it for me um because I think that that does a nice little feed um so university is on fire and I'm I'm gonna stick a pin in this I don't know if we have time to talk about it now but I wanted to talk about um just the little mm -hmm. snippet I got, and it, it relates to politics, but it's about the money behind universities, um, mm -hmm. either directly or to the people who, as in the write-up I read that you you summarized your book, uh, and didn't summarize, you touched on your book, you said that, you know, what do you do when a college, a university has a, has a clear climate awareness, but... Um, High level folks as part of that university are also board members for a fossil fuel company. How right. is that? How does that work? And it's that's that's only one example of disparate goals, uh, you know, converging in in a university atmosphere. Well, that's that's well put. Um, there is, um, I mean, there's all kinds of interesting tensions that are just now being being tugged on. Um, it, one example is at, at Harvard, and I, I hate to use Harvard as an example of anything because they're such an outlier, but this is actually interesting. And again, Harvard is so influential um, that it's it's worth following. There's a, a law professor who specializes in environmental law and apparently has done just groundbreaking work in trying to do you know climate action law. Great stuff. Turns out she also sits on the board of ConocoPhillips. Um, and this is the same oil company that, thanks to President Biden, is now going to start drilling in uh, Alaska. Um, Which makes me crazy. Oh, my God. Yeah. So a lot of uh, a lot of Harvard faculty have called her out and said, this is this is a terrible contradiction. You can't be doing this. And then the divest Harvard group mm. of students came out and said, this is obscene. Uh, you're being you're being used as a you know, greenwash tool. Basically, that's the nicest way you could put about it. Uh, the faculty didn't that. mention this. The students did mention that apparently she's being paid more than $300,000 a year to sit on that board. Because now, I could see I could see giving somebody the benefit of the doubt if they weren't receiving a paycheck for being on the board and they were there to voice concerns over mm -hmm. uh, the path of that industry. But the pay is yeah. an entirely different animal in my boat. And that's how she and she defended herself along those lines, saying that I'm mm. here, to, I'm on the board to represent the world, you know, to represent you know, green causes and 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 to get them thinking about climate change. 
And I, I, I don't mention this to, to say burn the witch. I mean, I, I'm saying that this is, and I don't know enough about it. Uh, but right, you know, right, right. What I'm saying is this is the kind of tension we're going to be seeing. And again, that's, that's an outlier, right? I mean, Harvard mm -hmm. is an extraordinary case. But think about how many universities and colleges have received climate uh, fossil fuel company money for mm -hmm. various things. Um, I used to teach at a small college in Louisiana, and one of the professors had an endowed chair entirely funded by a local natural gas company. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, you know, or what do you do when you've got a faculty member who teaches petroleum engineering? Right. Uh, and, and they have to you know, put students in jobs uh, with companies like Mobil or Shell or Exxon. Right? Yeah. Um, and uh, the, there was a report uh, a couple of months ago about the amount of money from oil companies that were just given as grants to different colleges and universities, including Berkeley or Stanford, uh, millions mm -hmm. of millions. Of dollars. Um, so do we just say, no, we're not going to accept that? Um, yeah, and, that's yeah. intense. I, for one, am ready to be fascinated. Oh. You get into that more deeply in your book, right? That aspect as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm ready to be fascinated. Well, if you're not, no. gonna, if you're worried about your economic sustainability as an institution, how mm -hmm. do you say no to this money? You know? Right. I mean, and, and there's a fiduciary responsibility. So, how do you go to your board and say this? Uh, yeah. No. Turn down Kinoko Phillips, right? But then for the minority of institutions that actually have endowments of any significant size, investing in, in uh, oil, natural gas, and coal has been a great boon for the past couple of years, uh, thanks to the Ukraine war. Uh, but, you know, divestment it seems like a pretty stable thing to do. And yet mm -hmm. institutions can resist that because it's a it's a great cash cow to use. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, there's, and there's informal ways as well. Uh, you know, you think about when I mentioned the, the the town where the local community had its own local energy generator. Um, you know, what do you do when you're a university in an area that benefits from this? Uh, I, mm -hmm. I was talking to a, a president who uh, a big chunk of his board and a big chunk of his students came from fracking country, in the upper Midwest. Uh, and they were passionate about fracking. They they mm -hmm. thought that fracking was a, a gold mine for their communities, that it saved them from penury and destitution, that it was a wonderful thing. Uh, and yet at the same time, this president told me, it had uh, as well a bunch of really green activists who wanted you know to uh, you know move off of fossil fuels tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you balance that? I mean, this is the kind of politics that we haven't been talking about in higher ed, and that we have to talk about now. Wow. It's happening now. It's and happening now. Yeah, and we have to take this very seriously. The New York State climate law, big goals. That's what we're we're going to be running headlong into this uh, in New York because of the climate law. The mm -hmm. climate law requires an eighty-five percent greenhouse gas reduction uh, by twenty fifty over, I think, 90, 90 le 1990 levels, and it impacts every single sector of the state. It's not an intent to just change government. It's an intent to change the entire economy of the state of New York. And it is a signed, of course, now there's some backpedaling from Governor Hochul saying maybe the limits are too strong, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see how that all turns out. But every single state university campus is going to have to take a step on this. And in the step is not just about uh, it's not, it can't just be about how they operate at the campus, right? It is about what they're offering for education. It is about how they're connecting with their community. It is about what research they're doing and how they invest those dollars and moving that future forward. And mm -hmm. as Lauren said, there's a ton of opportunity that you can only grasp if you start, if you start recognizing all the changes that are currently happening and you actually face them with curiosity and a desire to figure shit out. <laughs> yeah. Let's change up our perspective. I, I'm so glad you you brought us back to, to Lauren's point about optimistic opportunity for this. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the prompt that I've been, I've been starting to use with audiences to ask them to think about what a solar punk university would look like. I love it. Um, now, the only downside for me for this is that I have not found good solar punk fiction. Uh, I mean, I found adequate solar punk fiction, but I, I really want a good short story or a novel to show people. If you have any recommendations, please, please let me know. Um, but Sounds like an opportunity for a writer right now. Oh, definitely. I'm thinking of my husband, actually. 
Well, climate, I mean, climate <laughs> fiction as a whole is is, is just growing, yeah. growing, right? But do you? Uh, how do you? Um, but right now, it's visual design that I've seen, and and also a couple of computer games. So, you know, mm-hmm. if you give images of that from like, uh, what's the person? Uh, Imperial Boy. Uh, if you give some of those great illustrations and say, All right, what does your campus look like if you imagine a solar punk future? Right? A positive, yeah, cool. official, uh, thriving Anthropocene. Uh, yeah. How do you design things? And that's that's a great you know prompt that can lead you in all kinds of directions. I Maybe actually that's started be my freshman design studio project that's moving cool. forward. Solar punk. Very cool. I would love to I- see. You. I've started asking in in uh, if I'm talking about climate in presentations, the 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 language has always been climate change is happening to us, um, mm. or climate change is happening because of us. And I've started to I've started to say so. Let's start this by recognizing that climate change is happening for us. Mm. Mm. And then and then people first of all, it's very uncomfortable when people think that way, but they start to think about if it's happening for us, ha- what is it trying, what is it telling us? What are we supposed to get out of this? What, what, um, you know? So um, if it's happening for us, what are we supposed to be learning from this circumstance? Uh, and in my mind, it starts to touch on things like how our relationship to natural systems is broken. And when uh, we design a building, we continue to break systems and we should be designing buildings to heal those systems. Uh, Maybe our relationships with our communities are broken. And if we're doing a project, how can that project start to heal the community relationships? So I found that helpful for me because it it sounds, I, I can then embrace climate change because it's happening for me. Yeah. Oh, that's it's interesting. A, wow. Well, that's quite a prompt. I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. <laughs> oh, good. It's happening good. for us. It's for happen. Yeah, I, I honestly think, that, and especially people who believe in a divine being who created all of this. What is this divine being trying to tell us? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's it's not, you know, if we're not responsible and someone else is, I suspect that they're not just dicking us around. They're trying to tell us something. What are they trying to tell us? Mm-hmm. What is I remember, revealed? sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I just said what's being revealed by this. Please, please go ahead. I was just going to say, and I don't, I this jumped into my head. Mark Twain wrote an autobiography that he intentionally didn't release for 200 years yes. because he didn't want it to insult or offend anyone that he brings up in the book. And this question has me thinking like, oh, it's like the answer is sort of like, oh, we've been doing it wrong the last 200 years, but they didn't want to offend anyone. So it's happening right now. Right. <laughs> Very interesting. I could talk with you, Brian, all all day. I mean, I know, fascinating. I know. We have to meet again in real time and space at some point. Um, not look. that I rely on real time and space, but <laughs> be fun. <laughs> well, we have we have to use those things. I mean, space time is is pretty picky like that. We're touching on the Living Future Conference. See, I'm speaking uh, on something. I'll send you a link for the Albany Riverfront Collaborative, which. I think you'd find interesting. I'm speaking on that at the International Living Futures Conference in in early May. Oh, lovely! Can you? Oh, you should check out the International Living Futures Conference. You'd be. uh, I should check it out. When is it? May third through fifth, and the uh, the third through fifth, and the um, the theme is justice and belonging, and it's uh, the the Mm. industry, the International Living Futures. Uh, Institute is all about the built environment and how we need to be, uh, they they have a living building challenge, which is all about understanding natural systems, community systems, beauty, place, culture, uh, materials. Mm. Um, ILFI is a a wonderful organization. Oh, that sounds great. That sounds great. Uh, I'll send you some links. If I'm in town, I would love to meet up with you. I would, I would love that. That would be fantastic. And more on travel. I'm, I'm traveling a lot uh, as part of this um, uh, book. I'm, I, I was just in, I'm to lost, I've lost track now. Colorado, Wisconsin, New York. Um, you know, before that, um, California. Um, I've got Philadelphia wow. and, and Virginia, and more coming up. 
uh, and I'm trying to do as much of it online as possible and also trying to do as much of it on train as possible. But yeah. uh, academia is still based on on flying. Um, yeah. So it's tricky to be past that. Um, well, good for making the efforts. And and yeah. wow, you must be learning a lot about um, the the faults in our in our train system in particular. <laughs> it's hard to get here to there. I mean, you know, yeah. our, you know, I'm just just trying to get to places in in New York or Pennsylvania that aren't Philadelphia mm. City is 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 tricky. It's tricky. Uh, yeah. All right, so it's time to wrap up. What I'd like yeah. to say is I can't can't wait to see what you do next and i hope you'll you'll keep us informed of what that is well thank you so much uh, i've got a, a, a stack of book project ideas that i'm <laughs> talking to different people about I've, I've had a couple of publishers ask me to pitch them on different things and i'm so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out but one one would be if there's a need for it would be a follow-up on this um a follow -up yeah. on either an update yeah. or a look at uh what we've seen that you know practical stuff for campuses to do um, that's cool. Yeah, yeah that's I'm, cool. I would love I'm, to see that. Yeah. I'm ordering it today. <laughs> yeah, well, same. I can't that. wait to read it. I'm so excited. I'll probably hand out copies to everyone on my campus because uh, we my should all be. My publisher thanks you, and I love you both. <laughs> <laughs> Have right. a marvelous weekend, and keep up yeah. the good work, both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's great to reconnect with both of you and uh, Lauren to see your dog, Jody to see your your, your games. Um, I, I hope you all stay well and I'm looking forward to hearing more from you. <laughs>